Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Futurist Conference brought to you all by Untraceable. Glad to have you all join us on this excellent panel about the future of gaming and NFTs. Uh, I started playing video games when I was six at Super Mario Brothers and was introduced to digital items and currencies. And uh, unfortunately, I don't play as much today as I'd like to, but it's great to see how the gaming industry is really driving adoption for uh, cryptocurrencies and particularly NFTs. So we're going to turn it over to our excellent panelists to introduce themselves and talk to you a bit about what their companies do. And then we'll get right into uh, more about the NFT space and the future of the gaming industry. Jason, can you start? Yeah, I'd love to, Marcus. So my name is Jason Cassidy, and I am the owner and CEO at Game Credits. And we are the first blockchain gaming cryptocurrency in history. We are launched all the way back in February of 2014. And our focus is on harmonizing the traditional gaming world through esports with the burgeoning cryptocurrency space with a focus on NFTs. So we have a lot of tools on our platform that facilitate growing the ecosystem, like in exchange for NFTs, we have an NFT foundry actually that we just launched. Uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff there to help bring the industry forward. Excellent, thank you for that. Agro, can you go next? Sure, I'm CEO of Splinterlands. Uh, Splinterlands is a digital trading card game uh, built using a blockchain. The cards are unique uh, unique tokens that the players can battle with. Uh, as they rank up, they're able to earn higher and higher prizes, uh, and they're able to go trade these cards on secondary markets. And um, for, for a little while now, we've been one of the most popular, um, one of the most popular blockchain games, one of the most popular just blockchain uh, applications that are out there. And um, we're doing everything we can as a company to really try to push out of just a, the crypto market and into mainstream gaming. Excellent, excellent. And then Mickey, if you'll introduce yourself and talk about your company. Yeah, uh, I'm Mickey Maher. I'm head of partnerships at Dapper Labs. Uh, Dapper Labs is probably most well known for uh, creating and launching CryptoKitties back in 2017. Um, recently, um, we are, we've launched a game in partnership with the NBA, a collectible experience plus a game called NBA Top Shot. And we've recently launched our own um, layer one blockchain called Flow. And Flow is a blockchain for open worlds, gaming, uh, and collectible experiences. So like Agro like said, we are also trying to uh, bring a mainstream gaming audience and a mainstream uh, market to uh, to the blockchain, not through crypto, but through entertainment. Yeah, I think that's important. Again, there's 3 billion gamers worldwide. Um, as you all know, uh, most of what's happening in the, the Bitcoin space is mostly around mining and, and trading and cryptocurrencies in general. But if you really want mass adoption, it's got to move away from that kind of niche area to the, the larger population. So let's do some level setting. Jason, can you for the audience, describe what or explain what an NFT is and, and how it is similar and then different from Bitcoin. Sure. So this is a really exciting time in cryptocurrency because if we look at the advent of cryptocurrency, for the first decade, it was all about fungible currencies. And fungibility speaks to the likeness or the interchangeability of an asset. So US dollars, US dollars, US dollar, a Bitcoin's a Bitcoin's a Bitcoin, etc. NFTs which is non-fungible tokens, is the exact opposite. It's everything else in the world that is unique and is not fungible. So think of your home, if you own a home, the deed to your house, that's gonna be unique. Your house has unique features, it's got a unique value proposition to it. That deed could be the form of an NFT. In-game items, which is why we're here talking about gaming, is a huge part of the NFT space. Um, there's a lot of areas that are opening up like art, so NFTs captures the hearts and minds of individuals that are being onboarded into the space in a way that potentially fungible currencies haven't. And I think that's something that we're seeing with the gaming industry because gaming is something that we get excited about. It's often an escape from reality. And I think that really ties into the narrative of NFTs being able to do just about anything. Really excited about the future there. Agro, can you talk a bit about, as a game developer, what does an NFT bring functionally or, or experientially to a game that, that gives you extra 
assets or, or tool sets to, to make a better and different, more immersive game? Uh, I guess the two the two things that I'm going to look at are uh, utility and ownership. So in a traditional game, you know, you don't own anything. Uh, you own the program or a license to the program. You spend your sixty dollars. You play for a month. You beat the game, and then you put it away. And maybe you got an internet friend or two, but there's not much to show for it. Um, in with a crypto game, all of the all of the NFTs are tokens that you own in your wallet, and you are able to trade them on secondary markets. Uh, sometimes you're able to earn them as part of that experience, and uh, you get to go use them. And what that could be, you know, uh, mining them, farming them, trading them, harvesting them, storing them. You know, there's like a, a lot of different ways: battling with them, fighting with them, racing with them. You know, all these all these different assets are things that you now get to own, you get to control, and it's your your blockchain, um, you know, key pair and your your unique ID that is telling the blockchain and telling the apps what what you would like to do with your tokens and how you'd like them to engage. Um, and so you have all this utility, you have that ownership, and now. You know, if you play a game for six months and put it down, you can go sell it, rent it, or do whatever. Uh, and you're not just out your sixty dollars. You you may have even earned money while you were uh, playing your game and having your entertainment. Uh, that's definitely important now as we move more and more to kind of a digital gaming ecosystem. I believe it was Microsoft announced they have a fully digital version. You know, a discless console. And and my guess is that you know Nintendo and Sony will be following suit. So definitely you want to, and, and I've had the experience of buying a game in the past for older systems and, and just not having access to either the game or any kind of badges or things of that nature. So I want to understand from an, an app experience perspective, uh, Mickey, can you tell me more about what NFTs bring there? Yeah, I mean, you know, from an app experience, NFTs, uh, look a lot like traditional um, digital goods. I think it's the properties and the uses of them that, that are different. Um, you know, uh, as I wrote, mentioned, there is this the true ownership concept of it. Um, and, and the true ownership concept really uh, kind of dives into the peer-to-peer -peer ability to have permissionless peer-to-peer -peer trading in marketplaces. And a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is an excellent way to build a community, to engage a community, to get people within your game or within your experience talking and interacting with each other. So because NFTs have or enable true ownership and because uh, there is permissionless and seamless peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading uh, or selling, you're able to, you know, inherently build the community aspect just through that. Um, there are other interesting things that I think that NFTs bring to an app or gaming experience. I, I love the concept of uh, uh, NFT mutation or NFT combination that unlocks a, a new NFT or combines NFTs together to create a, a super NFT. Uh, you saw this a little bit in CryptoKitties where you took the genetic makeup of one CryptoKitty, which we called Catributes, uh, you combined it with another cat, the Catributes from another kitty, and out popped a, a random new kitty. Could be uh, very unique, could be generic, you just never knew. And look, uh, with true ownership of NF NFTs comes this concept of verifiable uh, scarcity and exclusiveness. So um, due to smart contracts and the properties of NFTs, you can verify and your user base or your fans can be confident that uh, no more of this type of digital good will ever be made, will ever be printed. You have X of Y and that's the only, you know, the amount that will ever exist uh, with those properties. So. You can verify exclusive, exclusivity and scarcity of that item, which is unique to NFTs in the digital space. Yeah, we got a question that just came in. It says, what are the main barriers for crypto adoption in gaming? Jason, can you take that one? 
Yeah, this is a pretty important one. And I think as founders in the space, we all feel this a little bit. Uh, education is still really important. Uh, Ethereum is where a lot of the gaming applications for the blockchain world exist. So now you're talking about having a wallet and you're talking about Web3. So for some people, that's a big barrier. And when you're in the crypto space for long enough, we use that euphemism, the rabbit hole. Well, it really is a rabbit hole. Uh, and you can kind of get into this ivory tower where it's common for you. So you apply that to your mindset that it's going to be common for everyone else. And the reality is it's not. So there's going to be definitely a, a evolution with Web3 that's coming. Uh, and I was actually listening to the previous talk and Amir mentioned that uh, there's going to be probably this phase in from Web 2 to Web 3. It's not going to be this direct jump right to Web 3. And I agree with that. Um, I think that's wishful thinking. So there's a lot of different pain points right now. Honestly, um, obviously, the scalability is going to be an issue because, again, if we're talking about blockchain gaming, we're talking about Ethereum. And now we're talking about gas and that battle. So now we're talking about side chains. So there's a couple different barriers. There's the technological barrier and then there's an the educational barrier. I think that we're all tackling both those as best as we can. So we're all waiting for Ethereum 2.0 in terms of the technical aspect and education is something that we're gonna have to keep working at. So I'd say those are probably the two biggest areas that as a founder, I still feel pain points in. Marcus, I would love to, I'd love to jump in here if, if I yeah. could. Um, we at Dapper Labs built CryptoKitties um, to test this concept of driving a mass market user to the blockchain, leveraging soft and friendly IP in gaming or in, in, or gaming or engagement loops or mechanics. It was uh, successful to an extent. Uh, we were the first to do it. We're still probably the most well known to do it. And we, we scaled up as much as we possibly could. And we were able to drive um, some of a mass, you know, some of a mass market and mass audience into the experience, but um, there are heavy limitations on many of the you know early or existing blockchains that I th in our opinion as a company that will prevent a mass market experience from ever truly existing on, on those um, from a gaming perspective on those platforms, and it's exactly why after we built CryptoKitties and we learned uh, what the, you know, what the goods and the bads of Ethereum were from a gaming perspective, um, we took those learnings from a real live experience and built those learnings into our own blockchain flow. So to the point that was made earlier, scalability is certainly an issue, right? There are, if you want to build a game, uh, you could probably support, depending on how you build it, if you build it blockchain native like CryptoKitties, you can only support 10, 20,000 users at a time. Uh, game companies don't get out of bed for that. So scalability is just a huge blocker. Then there's the um, understanding of it, the UI, UX, the onboarding of it. Um, we are of the opinion that the way it exists today on Ethereum or you know other blockchains, the, the truly um, non-custodial way where you need to keep track of your private keys, download a, a Chrome plugin, et cetera, uh, you'll never be able to get a mass market onto that. It, it just will never happen. So with Flow, we also um, not only address the scalability, uh, we address onboarding. So onboarding onto Flow dApps looks very much like the traditional app store uh, with fiat payments, et cetera. And I think the third big thing is the cost, uh, the cost of selling NFTs or the cost of, of doing anything mass market on Ethereum. I'm hearing from a lot of Ethereum developers today that they're trying to sell a $2 NFT and the, the gas cost because of, you know, DeFi activity are 50, 60, 70 bucks. So someone's got to pay $72 for a $2 NFT. It's just a not, a, not feasible to run that type of business there. Um, and we already knew that from from CryptoKitties, so we built um, we built Flow to have uh, the transaction fees orders of magnitudes less than we see in Ethereum, as well as um, the ability for uh, anyone to sign a transaction on behalf of anyone else. So a DApp developer could very easily and natively pay for transactions if they so choose. Yeah, you, you definitely touched a nerve. This is like the central question. How do you get 
how do you get people into this base? And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I think these guys are nailing it that you have to provide a web 2.0 sign up experience with web 3.0 benefits. And, uh, I, I don't think that's a single point. That's a spectrum, right? You have to go make it as easy as possible. And these guys that have nothing, know nothing, they come in with an email and a password. And then over time, you know, they start owning assets and buying cards and having all these different, um, you know, goods that they own and can trade and tokens and non-fungible tokens. And then somewhere along the line, you know, $600 later, they're like, Hey, maybe I should start caring about my keys and my security and all that. So, uh, you kind of have to, to move them along in that regard. So finding, finding blockchains that, uh, really make it so you don't even have to own any cryptocurrency to start, but that scale with a user is, uh, essential for the growth. That's the goal, right? To have blockchain gaming, just be gaming powered by blockchain, right? So you don't notice is there. Uh, yeah, the last year. go ahead. Uh, that's totally right. I mean, we, we do everything we can to make blockchain invisible to a new user and accessible to an advanced user. But like, you know, no, none of the AAA studios will like shove it in your face, which Amazon server they use to give you the game. Right. So that has to be, it has to be invisible, but they should be saying, Hey, look, here's a secondary market. Isn't that cool? Hey, look, I get crypto every time that I win. Isn't that cool? They, we should, we should be celebrating all the benefits that come from this, but it can't be, um, it can't be, Hey, you know, here's this really nerdy, highly technical thing that you should hear about first. You know, I know that there's tons of us that are passionate and there's a lot of devs in this community. So that gets pushed first, but honestly, that's not that's not how mass adoption works. It works by, you know, here are these cool benefits, just come on, just come play, it's real simple, use your email, and by the way, uh, welcome to crypto, and uh, over time you'll realize it's a life-changing experience. Yeah, that's exactly right. Promote the benefits, obfuscate the tech. Yep. I'll never forget 18 months ago, my daughter, bought her first virtual currency. Uh, I turned off my TV while I was playing Fortnite uh, to go help my wife move some furniture. And then I got an email from Sony because my daughter, she was 18 months old again at the time, she bought you know $10 worth of V-Bucks. So it's like, how do we get uh, NFTs and, and crypto buying that experience or the experience of buying them to be as simple as buying V-Bucks inside of Fortnite? Well, you'll be yes. happy to know, you'd be happy to know if you go out and check out NBA Top Shot, you will see an experience that mirrors that. And you got to worry about uh, the government in that case, because they're oftentimes the one that make that as tricky as possible. So, you know, technically going from credit card to crypto is literally one of the simplest things humanly possible uh, for us to do in this space from a technical standpoint. From a legal standpoint, they have put a million barriers in the way of yeah. allowing people to do that. So, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, many many in this space don't care for, right? Like, this is my money. I should have some freedom. I should be able to choose what what I'd like to do with that funding, and that is not what the government likes to do. There's been some talk of the U.S. having their own virtual currency, right? A stable coin. Is it? I'm going to get the term wrong. USDT. I think I heard, or it could be something else. Um, can someone explain? Do you think if that's going to make the space more, or make the regulations? Uh, more cooperative for developers? I don't know. Uh, I think that the U.S. will not be near the first one to do that, but I do think some governments will do that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that will make it easier or harder. It depends on you know, uh, how much they want to promote their own government currency and regulate everyone else versus uh, want to open it up. I would probably lean towards it becoming more regulated if the central bank launched its own digital currency. But I, I, I don't know. And I think it's probably a long, long, long way, if ever, that the U.S. does that. But there will be other governments that try it, I'm sure. But it'll be fun when they introduce 100 million new people into crypto. And, you know, they hopefully they can recognize or smell the difference between here is this central government coin and all of the rules and tricks about how that works 
as opposed to here are all these public open source blockchains and how those work. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that at the very least they start introducing a mass market of people that are in touch with governments into the cryptocurrency space. And, uh, you know, I imagine that will benefit all of our projects uh, and all the people that play them and own assets. And uh, we'll all go to the, the same moon when that starts happening. I kind of feel like it'll be Libra before the government. I think Libra has access to so many users that uh, they, can, they can potentially do that. Matt, took the words right out of my mouth. I think I'm looking at Libra before I'm looking at the central banks for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and central bank digital currencies are ultimate cryptographic double-edged sword. They, they just mentioned why. On the one side, you're going to have mass awareness that we would be jealous of in terms of how many people are going to be made aware. And that's over here. And then over here, we have the fact that governments historically, no matter what time period or where they're from, they don't like competition. So I ultimately would probably agree with uh, Mickey that there's going to be a lot more regulation coming. So there's going to be some positives, but uh, there's going to be a lot of competition coming. And I'm not, I don't have rose-colored glasses on about what the future will be with, with that aspect either. Jason, you and I have been having several conversations over the last few months around NFTs and esports. What are your thoughts on the opportunities that create for players and teams and, and arenas and the markets in that space? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, it takes us a little bit off of uh, the traditional path of NFTs when we talk about esports, but I think there's definitely a story that's starting to write itself. Tokenization, obviously, for the teams and the players is going to be a huge aspect. I think this is going to allow the fan base to also connect a little bit closer with these players as they can start to monetize themselves, whether that's making an avatar of itself digitally or if the team is going to be looking after that aspect of it. There is the memorabilia aspect as well, too. I think players are going to start to be able to create moments. So to give an example, in the future, uh, as blockchain-based games become more important, let's imagine it's an MMORPG or um, a first-person shooter. If you get one of these games that's going to be blockchain based to have a really big esports falling around it, eventually you're going to have a tournament that's going to have 50, 100 million people watching. Imagine you get down to the final match, okay, and both players are pimped out with all their gear and someone kills the other player with that weapon. If it's on the blockchain, it's going to have a hell of a story to tell in terms of its immortality. And if that player now decides to sell that, that becomes the ultimate eBay. Um, type of offering where that could be worth a lot of money and that also starts to educate the fan base I think because some fans that are traditional gamers I've heard the conversation where they're like Jason why do I care about owning my own items so I think when you have someone that's looked up to that has a lot of following that's a bit of um, playing a bit of a leader role like these esports professionals are when they are showing that they can own their own in-game items and all the cool aspects that come out of that that's going to send a strong message to all these players out there and also the fans that are watching that this is something that's real now and that there's actual benefits around this. So I only think there's going to be good things coming from NFTs in uh, the esports arena, and I think it's going to be around the monetization aspect for the most part. Esports definitely needs some help with monetization, as I understand it. Compared to traditional sports, it advertises its audience, its fan base at about $50 a person. Esports right now is only monetizing about $5. So that to give them th different opportunities and digital scalable opportunities to create revenue, I think is a very good opportunity uh, for the market. Mickey, can you talk to me a bit about where you've leveraged Dapper and Flow to expand CryptoKitties and, and beyond? Uh, I know I remember one of my coworkers saying that there's a game where you can take CryptoKitties and feed them the dragons. I don't know if you can speak to the inter interoperability or, or where, where you're pushing the limits there. Well, we're not we're not doing anything, um, and that's the beauty of blockchain. Uh, you know, we call this concept. Um, you know, people call it interoperability. We call it composability. It, 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 the the words are interchangeable. It's the the concept that smart contracts are open and permissionless, and you can create these open worlds uh, on top uh, on top of these core uh, projects, right? So you can call CryptoKitties a core project, and on top of crypto, CryptoKitties, um, without our permission and frankly without our knowledge, spun up this whole world of 30 third-party developers called the Kittyverse. 
there were about 50 developers building things on top of CryptoKitties, leveraging uh, the smart contracts that we built for CryptoKitties. You saw a dating app like Tinder for kitties, where you could swipe right or left on, on different CryptoKitties. You saw uh, something called Kitty Hats, where you could accessorize your kitty with a hat, scarf, etc. And this is this kind of taps into a concept that I brought up earlier, which is like the mutation. If you bought a hat for your cat, put it on your cat. Well, what the the most interesting there, thing there is your cat. The cat now owns the hat. You don't own the hat. The cat owns the hat. So either the hat goes with the cat always, or if you take the hat off, um, it, 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 you you burn the hat. It it, it goes away. Um, so that's an interesting concept. There was something called kitty races where um, interesting about that is we had an algorithm which took the attributes, put it, put them together and spit something out. Kitty races basically took the same attributes, built their own algorithm and spit down like, or spit out like speed metrics that made one type of cat with certain attributes faster than, than another. So we saw that concept, um, pop up uh, on CryptoKitties. And, and in fact, this is the whole DeFi space at its core is this composability aspect. It, it applies to open worlds and gaming as well. So when we built Flow, we really wanted to enable and supercharge this composability um, scenario. Uh, so Flow smart contracts make it very easy and very seamless to build on top of uh, and to build these uh, experiences on top of uh, you know, these core smart contracts to, to create these this open world ecosystem. Ever, can you, you talk a bit about whether or not you think AAA studios or, or console publishers will be open to this type of idea? You know, we only just now got cross play, you know, in the last 12 to 18 months, thanks to Fortnite, right? Uh, and, and Rocket League. Do you think that there is an incentive or, or a reason why they should be opposed to creating this type of, again, cooperative environment for gamers? Um, you know, I, I haven't worked in a AAA studio, so I'm not sure that I can tell you what they're going to do. I, I worked in a big publishing company and I watched um, a really talented like startup just burn a hole through all of their profits. And then they acquired them and then uh, put their thumb on the business. So uh, they did everything they could to preserve their legacy business and um, so they, they acquired and stifled businesses. I don't know that the, the gaming industry will do that, um, but I, I think that they'll be fairly conservative. You know, I know that uh, Ubisoft, we're, we're part of their incubator and they uh, are actively looking at blockchain projects. Um, so there are, there are certainly some, some groups that are out there that are exploring this. Um, but I think, I think what's more likely is that uh, blockchain becomes so disruptive that uh, they don't really have much of a choice and they are in like an urgent react mode of like, but ultimately I think owning your own assets is a one way valve, right? The second that you start owning your, 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 uh, your sword and your armor and your characters and something custom about them, the idea that you will then go and play this other game and spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars and not own any of those things uh, will cease being appealing. So I think this is really a one-way valve. And uh, so I expect that AAA studios will get into it, but I, I think they're going to be dragged into it uh, more than like really being the technology pushers. And you know they have, they have millions of dollars of legacy business that don't do anything like this. And my guess is that they will act to preserve it up until the moment that they're like, Oh goodness! The entire ship is leaving right now, and we better we better adjust course. But I think they'll be kind of late to the party. That's my guess. Yeah, um, I've been in gaming 13 years. I started when Facebook opened up their platform to apps. Quickly became a gaming platform. Then I moved into mobile for about seven years. Um, AAA gaming studios. The the incumbents are always late to the party on emerging technology. Um, the winners on Facebook were Zynga, Playfish, uh, Indies, startups that built natively for the platform. The same thing happened on mobile. Supercell, King, uh, Rovio, the, those were the winners of mobile. 
the AAA studios came in late, had to make very expensive acquisitions, had to pay a lot of money to play catch up. There just isn't enough FOMO, for lack of a better word, in this space yet to get them to pay attention. As soon as someone builds a billion dollar game or even a half a billion dollar game on the blockchain, they will flood in in droves. Um, so it's up to this group here and anyone else listening uh, to be those native builders on the blockchain, to build those first hundred, five hundred million dollar businesses. And at that point, uh, the traditional game companies will have FOMO and they will they will rush in. And for those of you uh, who are newer to the space, FOMO is fear of missing out. Uh, I'm interested to see how this impacts franchise games. And, and I don't mean to pick on EA, but I think about Madden. Some people who are critical of Madden think that they pay every year for just a roster change, but that generally the, the gameplay experience is similar from year to year. So if you're you're able to kind of transfer characters that you own, or you know what what does that have on on your interest to continue paying that price? Does it mean that that you start creating I don't know I hate to use the term DLC, but some other kind of creative pricing strategy around a franchise where so many components of it are either reused or or, or updated? What are your thoughts there, anyone? So in in Splinterland, we have. Um, you know, our players come in, we don't, we don't really sell the game. We just sell individual card packs and, you know, in, in Madden, I've purchased Madden in the past. I spent my $50 and then I updated and I spent another 50 and that was a, you know, it was a bunch of money. Um, but it's not uncommon for players in Splinterlands to own thousands of dollars worth of cards. Um, and that's, it's different than going to the movies and it's different from, you know, just buying a, a, console game where you spend your 50 bucks and it's gone uh, those players aren't doing it that way they don't they don't see this it, it is entertainment but they don't see it as solely entertainment you know they they like owning an asset you know um and they they like owning a scarce asset and they like being in early into the into the space and into the game um and so i think i think as these companies um they're they're terrified that their mainstream of revenue is going to be uh demolished that you know we as a company make money by selling games and it is a big stretch to think we as a company are going to make money by selling uh tokens that represent in-game items and that is that's a big shift in it and it changes the economics it changes the way that the players interact it changes um it changes just like how the game even functions, what windows are there, what what tools you need, like just so much of what they've done for 20 years is just like, all right, that's great. Now leave all of that behind and do this other thing. So it's going to it's going to take some um, it's going to take some projects uh, either like Splinterlands or like an Axie or like a Sandbox, you know, some of these bigger games that are out there to go uh, really kind of push the envelope in terms of user base. Uh, when I asked the guys at Ubisoft, when do you guys start caring? They said, well, you gotta, you really gotta get up to something like 50,000 monthly active users. So Splinterland's been around for two years. We have 10,000 monthly active users. So even, even as one of the biggest games in the space, even as one of the most like successful long-term DAP projects in the space, we are still, you know, one fifth of where the AAA studios want us to be before we really get on their radar. So the, the, the cryptocurrency space just as a whole has to keep growing and we need many more games and many more projects and many more social media websites and all these tools. There's not like any one of them is enough. We just need to keep getting all these different things to enter this space so that somebody could come here and say, yes, I can get all of my needs met by participating here. It's not, it's not just one flow. It's not just one um you know erc20 that's existed forever it's not just one game it's you know you need you need this entire replacement economy to be functioning before the the masses start saying oh yeah well it not only is it convenient and i get my my tokens and i can do all these things and um then it starts shifting to yeah well why would i stick with what i'm doing so it, we gotta we gotta have everything that a consumer might need and more and have a better experience and then add all those, the, the, the benefits of crypto on top.
but you know, we, we got to grow to get there as an entire community. So still um, early days for the crypto space. We're running low on time. We've got about 60 seconds left. So if each of you would just give one sentence response to what is your futures prediction for August, 2021, start with you, Jason. Okay. Uh, at the current rate with NFTs, I believe you're going to see up to an order of magnitude growth um, sales volume from where you are today. I think it's going to explode. All right, Agro, you next. Yeah, we're, we're doing a land sale and uh, we're putting the power of players uh, in the hand of players to go mint cards. And I think uh, the more that we turn traditional revenue streams into player revenue streams, the faster that we're going to see this place explode. So I think, I think we'll see more things like that where you own land and now you can mint the NFTs. I think that gamified experience is coming. And then Mickey? We'll be doing this conference in person. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your time. I like that. That I like. like this. Uh, can you can you just share very quickly where people can connect with you online or what your 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 best means of contact are? Uh, everywhere: email, Twitter, Discord, Telegram. Choose choose your route. We're, um, and we're available at splinterlands.com and the best community to reach us through is the discord.splinterlands.com and we're on uh, Twitter as Splinterlands as well. And for game credits, you can find us at gamecredits.org and by far the best place to come for a social experience is our Discord channel. It's a party. You should check it out. Big party on Discord. Discord party. Well, thank you all for joining us for this panel and uh, have a great week. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting, Marcus.